On a map, the Gulf of Mexico seems straightforward. Just a neat, round indentation. A soft scoop out of North America's southeastern edge. A tranquil-looking bowl of blue cradled between the United States, Mexico, and Cuba. It looks like a place for gentle waves, shrimp boats, and palm-lined beaches. But to mistake that simplicity for a lack of complexity is to completely miss the point. The Gulf of Mexico is not just a gulf. It's a colossal engine, a place where continents, climates, and civilizations collide. It is one of the most influential bodies of water on the planet, and its story is anything but calm. An ocean, hiding in plain sight. At over 600,000 square miles, the Gulf of Mexico is enormous, larger than Iran, larger than France, larger than the entire landmass of the United Kingdom three times over. If Texas is your mental measuring stick, the Gulf swallows it whole twice and still has room left over for Louisiana. That kind of scale matters. It means the Gulf doesn't behave like a simple bay or a coastal appendage. It operates like a miniature ocean, following its own set of physical laws. It has tides, currents, storms, and ecosystems that rival any full-fledged sea. Its geography gives it away. The Gulf is semi-enclosed, surrounded almost entirely by land, like a bowl brimming with seawater. The only two doors out are narrow ones, the Yucatan Channel to the south, squeezed between Cuba and Mexico, and the Straits of Florida to the east, wedged between Cuba and the Florida Keys. These gates are narrow and restrictive, forcing the water inside to linger, swirl, and transform. But it's not just salt water from the Atlantic that gives the Gulf its character. The real story lies in what flows into it from the land. The American heartland, draining into the sea. An astonishing 33 major river systems, draining more than 60% of the United States, eventually empty into the Gulf of Mexico. Every raindrop that falls in Montana wheat fields, every snowmelt trickling down the Rockies, every storm soaking the Midwest, all of it, one way or another, ends up here. And reigning supreme among these rivers is, of course, the Mississippi. The Mississippi isn't just a river. It's a continental conveyor belt, a 2,300-mile artery that gathers the waters of America's interior and carries them to the Gulf. Every single second, it dumps 593,000 cubic feet of fresh water into the sea. That's a difficult number to picture. So imagine it this way. It could fill the entire Superdome in New Orleans in just three minutes. But water isn't all it carries. The Mississippi is also a sediment machine. Every grain of soil eroded from the Appalachian Hills. Every speck of prairie dirt lifted from Iowa farmland rides this river south. Over thousands of years, this steady flow built new land, expanding Louisiana outward into the Gulf with an ever-growing delta. New Orleans itself stands on ancient Illinois and Ohio, soil that traveled a thousand miles before dropping out into the Gulf marshes. The result is an environment unlike any other, part river, part ocean, forever mixing and churning. But there's a twist. The very sediment that once built new land is now disappearing. Levees, dams, and canals have cut off the natural process of replenishment, and Louisiana is losing its coastline at a terrifying pace. The Gulf once created land. Now it's taking it back. The Gulf beneath the waves. If you could drain the Gulf like a bathtub, you wouldn't see a neat bowl. Instead, you'd see a wildly varied underwater landscape. Off Florida and the Yucatan, the seafloor slopes gently, creating broad continental shelves. Vast, shallow platforms that nurture coral reefs, seagrass beds, and some of the most productive fisheries in the world. But elsewhere, the bottom falls away sharply, plunging into black, abyssal depths. The deepest point is the Sigsby Deep, a staggering 14, 183 feet down, more than two and a half miles beneath the surface. You might expect jagged canyons or trenches ripped open by tectonic chaos. Instead, it's eerily flat, smoothed over by millions of years of sediment. That sediment is more than just mud. It is a history book, written layer by layer, telling the story of the Gulf's explosive birth. 
born of fire and salt roll back the clock 200 million years to the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. North and South America were tearing away from Africa, and in the rift left behind, a shallow basin opened. At first, it wasn't the warm, tropical gulf we know today. It was a shallow, salty sea in an arid world, sometimes connected to the ocean, sometimes cut off. And here's where it gets strange. Each time the connection closed, the water evaporated under the relentless Mesozoic sun, leaving behind thick crusts of salt. This cycle repeated for millions of years until the entire basin floor was blanketed in a salt bed thousands of feet thick. Then came the rivers, ancient ancestors of the Mississippi and others, burying that salt under mile after mile of sediment. For most rocks, that would have been the end of the story. But salt is peculiar. Under enough pressure, it flows like honey. It is lighter than the heavy rocks above it, so it slowly pushes upward, warping the land into salt domes. These strange underground mushrooms would later prove critical, not just geologically, but economically, because as they rose, they created perfect traps for oil and gas. The Gulf's destiny had been written in salt, the Gulf as a Spanish lake fast, forward to human history. Indigenous peoples thrived along the Gulf's shores for millennia, building cultures around fishing, canoeing, and the fertile estuaries. But the Gulf entered global history in the 16th century, when the Spanish arrived. They named it El Golfo de Mexico and, for nearly 300 years, treated it as a private empire. The Gulf was their treasure highway. Silver from Mexican mines flowed north to Veracruz, then across to Havana, and onward to Spain in massive galleons. This turned the Gulf into a theater of conflict. English, French, and Dutch pirates prowled its waters, striking Spanish ships heavy with gold and silver. Ports like Havana and New Orleans became fortified strongholds, while the Gulf itself became a contested prize of empires. But the Gulf's greatest treasure was hidden beneath its waves. In the 20th century, Geologists realized those ancient salt domes were perfect vaults for oil and natural gas. And so, the Gulf became one of the richest petroleum provinces on Earth. Offshore drilling platforms sprouted like a strange steel forest, tapping into a resource born of prehistoric seas. From Spanish galleons to oil tankers, the Gulf has always been about wealth and about power. The Gulf as a storm factory Yet, for all its riches, the Gulf's most fearsome gift is not gold or oil, it's storms. The Gulf of Mexico is one of the greatest heat traps on Earth. Its semi-enclosed nature means warm water piles up and lingers. By late summer, the surface often exceeds 86 degrees, 30 degrees C, and it's not just shallow warmth. Thanks to the loop current, a deep, fast-moving river of tropical water that flows in from the Caribbean the Gulf stores heat down to extraordinary depths. This is why hurricanes love the Gulf. A storm drifting in from the Atlantic can hit these warm waters and suddenly explode in strength. Hurricanes are, at their core, heat engines. And the Gulf is their perfect fueling station. History proves the point. Katrina, 2005. Harvey, 2017. Michael, 2018. Storms that reshaped entire regions, all supercharged by the Gulf's stored energy. The basin that feeds shrimp boats and beach resorts can, overnight, become a factory for catastrophe, exporting warmth to the world. But here's the final twist. Not all that heat stays in the Gulf. The loop current doesn't just circle endlessly. It exits through the Straits of Florida and becomes something far more famous, the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is a super river of warm water, thousands of times more powerful than the Mississippi. It carries the Gulf's accumulated heat north and east across the Atlantic. When it reaches Europe, it releases that warmth into the air. That's why London, sitting at the same latitude as freezing Montreal, enjoys mild, rainy winters instead of bitter cold. Ireland's green fields, France's vineyards, the habitability of much of Western Europe, all are owed to the Gulf of Mexico, 
quietly shipping its warmth across an ocean. It's not just a regional sea. It's part of the planet's climate machine, cultures of the Gulf. The Gulf isn't only geography and climate, it's also people, millions who live along its shores and depend on it daily. On the U.S. side, it supports a fishing industry worth billions. Shrimp from Texas, oysters from Louisiana, grouper from Florida, all trace their roots to the Gulf's nurseries. Tourism thrives on its beaches, from Cancun's resorts to Florida's panhandle. On the Mexican side, the Gulf anchors cities like Veracruz, a cultural crossroads blending indigenous, Spanish, and Afro-Caribbean traditions. The rhythms of San Jarocho music, the flavors of seafood stews, the bustle of its port, all are tied to this sea. And across the water, in Cuba, Havana grew as the guardian of Spain's treasure fleets. Its harbor, still facing the same blue horizon that shaped its destiny. The Gulf is a mosaic of cultures, economies, and histories, all stitched together by a single body of water. The sea that refuses to be ordinary. So what is the Gulf of Mexico? It is a geological accident, born of salt and rifting continents, a treasure highway, once Spain's private lake, a petroleum powerhouse, its geology rewriting the modern economy, a climate engine fueling hurricanes locally and warming Europe globally, a cultural cradle binding together Cuba, Mexico, and the American South. It is not just a gulf, it is a restless, unpredictable, world-shaping force. Next time you look at a map and see that neat blue scoop under North America, remember, it is not an empty space. It is one of the engines of our planet.